today to invite uh, Associate Professor David Clark to HMRI um, to present on co-production um, in health services. David is from the University of Leeds. He has a background in nursing, but he's also had several years in qualitative research and ethnographic methods research, working in particular with multidisciplinary teams in stroke rehab. He's got three major clinical trials that he's working on at the moment, the first being one that's aiming to reduce sedentary behaviour in stroke survivors, a home-based exercise program for older people with frailty, and then one which he's going to touch on today called CREATE, which is about improving patient care and staff experience in health care. So he might draw on these clinical trials today to give examples of how you can use co-production in health services for research and also um, intervention development in clinical practice. So just a little bit of housekeeping. We'll have the lecture till about quarter to three. We'll hold all questions to the end if that's okay. If you do have questions remotely in Zoom, can you please type them into the chat section? And Gillian Mason, who's moderating the Zoom uh, broadcast, will um, be able to speak these to us at the end. So if you are in Zoom, just know that you can't be seen. You're on mute at the moment in terms of audio, um, and we'll take questions from you at the end. So if you're here in person, we've got afternoon tea starting about 3 o'clock. Um, till about 3.30, which is just, just out there in the Haggerty space. And I think that's everything for now. So um, welcome, David. We look forward to it. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, thanks again, for everyone, for um, giving up your time this afternoon and those of you remotely too. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here in Newcastle. I was just saying to Heidi before I started, were we in Newcastle in England? then that the accent there is impenetrable, very <laughs> difficult to. <laughs> but I hope that uh, my English accent will go down okay this afternoon. Um, so, if I can find the right buttons, we'll make a start. So, uh, co-production is certainly a buzzword. Um, we might discuss later on whether it's a woolly word. Um, but I think, it, for me, it was important just to consider whether or not this was something which was on trend, if you like, at the moment, or whether it was something that genuinely added value uh, to clinical practice and to research. Just before we start, and I know we can't do it on Zoom, but it would help me just to know a bit about uh, those of you who are predominantly working in research, if you would just wave at me. Okay, that's great. And those of you who are working predominantly clinically, anybody? Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm sure some of these researchers are also working clinically. Okay, that's really helpful, thanks. I was intrigued that you said I had a background in nursing. It's that long ago, I think uh, they would disown me, but yeah, I guess I did start there, but it's a long time ago, yeah. Okay, um, so some of the things I hope we'll get time to talk through, just something around the words, something about origins, because I think we think this is new, but of course it's not. Um, we think it's, uh, it's come from the US and what things haven't, I suppose. Um, there is a big issue around power and we'll touch on that. Uh, definitely two examples in stroke rehabilitation, two different ones, um, but also want to acknowledge there is work going on throughout Australia and certainly here. Um, this is not my... Uh, so, uh, and also some challenges and rewards, I think. Is it adding value? I think it's a, a key question. So under the umbrella of co-production, we'll find some words that are commonly used, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of those, but we'll maybe tease out some of those differences. So co-production, that broad umbrella, but underneath that, uh, commonly used terms are co-design in particular, which is something I'll talk about in this, the work that we've done, but also related to that with a long history is co-creation. And then some people talk also about co-innovation. I mean, the principles are broadly the same, engaging with people who use either services uh, or use particular products in order to ensure that their voices are heard. But it's much more than just hearing voices, I think. So um, it's not new, as I've said, and if you have a look at the literature, then certainly the term seems to be associated with a professor from uh, Indiana University in the 1970s, a lady called Eleanor Ostrom. And one of the things I think that she was interested in really was that the sort of um, the nature of participation in a public service in a sense that it's involuntary. Uh, necessarily, if you use a service, then you engage with the service provider in that service. So yes, you're participating, but usually you have no voice in how that service is structured, how it's organized and how it's delivered. Um, and obviously there can be dissatisfaction with that process. And I think it occurs from both uh, partners and certainly the work that she was talking about at the time. This isn't just about service users saying this is not working. It's often also about the people who provide the service saying this is not working for the people that we want to provide that service for. So some origins there, certainly associated with movements to challenge professional power, 
um, it's the 1970s, all sorts of things are going on there that uh, were interesting. Uh, but to increase citizen participation in those, those public services and part of public administration. Um, but also, um, it, it was also a time, and again, I think you'd recognise these things are very similar today, uh, a time when we were looking to uh, reduce public spending and big question marks over whether core production is being used, if you like, to introduce service users uh, to replace service providers in, in those areas. So I think some of those issues which were very prevalent in the 1970s are certainly re-evident, if you like, at this point in time. Um, there were any number of studies you could look at, but one which is often cited is uh, a piece of work by Edgar Kahn, and uh, he employed um, a co-production approach in reform of the youth justice system in Washington. <coughs> that must have been a mammoth task, I think. Uh, we, criminal justice systems are problematic, I think, the world, the world over in terms of providing equitable services, but also managing that, that uh, element of custodianship and, and punishment. But um, that this system at that particular time nearing collapse and this innovative approach, if you like, used by Khan, um, looked at involving both the youth who were involved in that, but also their families in reshaping and redesigning that, that service and had some considerable success, it would seem, um, in reducing um, re-offending by those young people through, through that process of engagement and listening to those voices and, and looking at different ways of the experience of that service or the experience of that provision, then looking at how that might be altered. And very interestingly, I think, looking forward to just very recently, there's a, a study being published supported by the uh, RAND organisation, which has used experience-based co-design uh, in a very similar way. It's called a share, um, co-share project, very interesting, and looking at individuals returning to the community after um, custodial sentences, looking at both their health needs, but also their welfare needs after a custodial sentence, both in the short term and the long term. Um, so very interesting. Uh, juxtaposition of those two elements, as it were. But certainly after that initial enthusiasm, if you like, times change, of course, and different priorities uh, affect both public services and, and much more broadly societies. And certainly throughout the 80s and 90s in the United States, but also certainly in the UK, I think we were, um, if you like, uh, implored to move towards a, a market-driven approach in the National Health Service um, to think much more about the user of that service as a consumer of that service, that they needed more choice. They needed, we needed almost a semi-privatization of the NHS to ensure it was more competitive. It drove up the standard and so on. But in doing that uh, shift towards that market economy, then the opportunity for collaboration of, of service users w was much reduced or minimized. If, if it ever was prevalent in the NHS at that time, then certainly it was marginalized. So the focus was less on collaboration, much more on that uh, competitive drive, supposedly to increase standards. That's uh, for another day, isn't it, that discussion? But certainly since the early to mid 2000s in the United Kingdom, there's been uh, a lot of talk about co-production, then a lot of investment in co-production, in part driven, I think, for us by the National Institute for Health Research, which is a major funder uh, for health research in the UK, very substantial investment. And, and of course, some of you will be involved in funding applications. And it's been interesting in the last sort of five years for me as, as somebody who reviews funding applications for that organization, that the word co-production was, well, I, I never saw it before 2010, let's say, and now it's unusual not to see it in a, in a large program of research. So something's happened in that time that we've, we've re-engaged potentially with this, this area. Um, you know, the background is also quite important that we increasingly, I think here and, and possibly in Australia too, dissatisfied with some of that, um, the leftover, if you like, of the market economy driving in the NHS and some of the things that it did in terms of uh, dismantling services or making them more difficult to access um, in the name of progress. So th there's been a dissatisfaction in that process and uh, there's been a great interest, if you like, in consumer engagement in public participation. And the NIHR has driven this agenda for us very much in terms of public um, uh, participation uh, and involvement in research. Um, and it's driven it to the extent that it, you couldn't really have uh, funded research without making sure that you did more than tick the box, that there was that PPI involvement in all research. Uh, and it was more than a token approach. So, that, so they've driven part of that agenda. <clears throat> so some uh, attempts to define that. There are any number. If you, you look anywhere, you'll find dozens of different definitions. But some of these are, are, are worth a look, I think. So Osborne writing from a um, a public administration sort of uh, background talks about co-production as being the voluntary or involuntary involvement of public service users. Um, and again, that's referenced back to Eleanor Ostrom, I think, in terms of voluntary involvement or involuntary involvement, and you necessarily participate in that service, whether or not it's a service that you feel is delivering to your needs. But 
involvement of those users in any design, management, delivery, or evaluation of those public services. And then more generally, these are from uh, Needham and Carr, who are writing in the uh, social um, care sector, if you like, and public health sector. They talk about enabling people to play roles in not only delivering services, um, sorry, delivering services, but, but they've been involved in the design of those services. And certainly for me this afternoon, uh, we will talk about the delivery end. We might, uh, that's a, an area for us to question, I think, at the end, how far are we able to progress? Uh, how far does the research progress for people to have that opportunity to not only design services, but to deliver them too? Uh, and another definition, again, from Needham and Carr is this. So co-designing a service or research, it's about sharing that decision-making power. Obviously easier said than done. Um, this means that people's voices must be heard, of course. And, and we've been good at that, I think, in terms of PPI over the years, particularly in the stroke field where I work. It's, people have a long and they often say a proud history of consultation and listening to voices of stroke survivors. I think it's only more recently we've, we've done a lot more than listen. And we, I think we've, we're acting now much more than we have in the past. So we, we have debated and we, we're now uh, acting upon those voices, perhaps more effective than we may, may have done in the past. So but on the surface, and it, you know, it seems like common sense. Why on earth wouldn't we listen to the people that we work with? Uh, why on earth wouldn't we listen to users of health service who, uh, in stroke and other areas who've had very, very significant experiences, life-changing experiences, affecting employment and family and everything else, redefining cells, of course. So, so why wouldn't we listen to those people? Well, we've not always had a good track record, I don't think, uh, particularly in nursing, I can speak for, uh, in a number of other professional areas, because, well, of course, we're experts, aren't we? And we, we know what's best for the populace in health terms. So and it's difficult to move away from that position, I think, sometimes that, uh, you know, we, we, we spend years preparing, uh, we, we uh, spend years in practice, we do develop that expertise that's necessary to, to give advice, to give information, to give prescriptions, if you like, for recovery. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's common sense, but it's not an easy transition necessarily to shift roles in that way, I don't think. So the on-trend bit for me is that uh, I think a bit like PPI 15 years ago, then it was a box that we needed to tick. And then people began to understand what PPI meant, what commitment it would take um, to do it well, what, how much it would cost, um, both uh, economically, but also in terms of the human resource. Um, and people like Involve for us in the NIHR drove that uh, engagement, I'm sure similar systems here. Um, so I think we're all, for me, we're at that point with co-production um, that we, we've, we begin to understand what the word means, but I don't think we've uh, fully grasped uh, necessarily in the UK what it might mean in terms of using that both in research, but also in terms of service improvement more generally in health services or in, public, in the public sector more widely. So, but that's my view. So uh, you might say it's the new zeitgeist is, uh, it's the, if you like, the spirit of our times is co-production. It is the go-to approach in, in terms of developing interventions or in terms of improving services, be they in the social se care sector or be in the health sector. So, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> and this is a particularly useful way, I think, of just raising that. The preoccupation perhaps with citizen engagement, with public participation, with involving people. And the lived experience word is a very, another one, it's a very common one. And I'm not dismissing it. It's fundamental to, to people who experience the problems that you, we deal with. So I'm not dismissing it or diminishing it in any way. But, but I think you know, co-production is not necessarily uh, just about that lived experience. So but we'll see. Um, so it is, I think, now advocated as a normative good. It's a thing that we should be considering um, in terms of either service delivery improvement or in terms of research. Of course, it assumes that equal partnership in relations, which is problematic for me. It's something I'd like to achieve and something I found it more difficult to achieve in groups, uh, despite um, the right intentions and approach. Um, sometimes the way we set this up uh, perhaps can give uh, a false impression of citizen power. Sometimes we can deliver and deliver on that well. But I think it, it's another challenge that we need to think about. Um, perhaps, um, certainly in some of the work I'll mention this afternoon, then um, the power, if you like, is, is vested more in the, in the researchers and the, the clinicians, and it's difficult to wrest that from them. But, and maybe we don't always need to do that either. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on some of that hopefully. And of course, the people that come along and get engaged in um, either PPI as it was or co-production as it is now, and they're often, as, you know, they're self-selecting groups, even with an, a participative approaches, um, even with purposive sampling approaches, then they, you know, they're often of a particular uh, social group, particular background, particular history, and a particular desire to get involved in that. And again, that's not a bad thing because they have, they bring with them skills and knowledge and experience that we want to use. But 
but they're not representative often of that wider population. It's much harder to, to get that uh, representative group. So I work in Bradford in the north of England. Its population, for example, is 20% South Asian. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult for us to get people from that population to get involved in any of our work, um, never mind to get involved in co-production. And yet they're a group that, you know, one in five of the people that we work with are from that, from that background. Um, so we've not cracked that nut particularly yet. Another challenge, I think, with co-production is about ensuring that skillful facilitation. <clears throat> we'll come back to that one. Well, one way that's been helpful for us when we've been thinking about our projects is to look at this notion of a continuum of co-production. So where are we on that continuum? What is it that we're doing which matches up with the ideal, if you like? Um, and I know there's a lot of text on here, and I apologise for that, but just a, a couple of words to pick out, if you like. At the basic co-production end, we're talking about participation in the way that Ostrom did. So very often people are complying with the social norm or expectation. You go along to your GP and it, it's normal that you perhaps will discuss things with him or her, but normally you, if she gives you a prescription or he, then you're likely to go along with that after some debate perhaps. But generally people at that level of co-production have no real influence on how the service is designed or delivered. Intermediate is moving up of course from that, more actively recognises that people have skills, um, assets, um, and that um, those, those, their knowledge, their skills, their experience can be very useful in improving that service and we, we engage with people in a range of ways to do that. But generally speaking, we, we, we selectively ask for that information or input um, from time to time rather than routinely do that. And right at the far end, if you like, delivering many of those ideals of co-production is this notion of transformational co-production where so the power and the control changes um, so that people who are using those services are involved in all of those aspects. It's not just about occasional engagement, but they're designing, they're commissioning and they're delivering services. And my only experience of this total engagement is in the mental health setting where there, is, uh, there are a number of projects which have moved down that route so that there is a much more active and transformative engagement of service users in that area. That's not something we've achieved necessarily. <clears throat> Another way of looking at the same thing is um, something, it's, it's a modified version of something called Armstein's Ladder. And if we start at the bottom, the red elements, then commonly, certainly my experience as a student and then a clinician, uh, very often much of the health provision I was involved in was, I don't know that we coerced many people, but uh, we did expect people um, to, to agree that we were looking to do good. Uh, we were certainly thinking about educating. We certainly wanted to inform people to change their health behaviors. And that was really important. Uh, but we were doing two and not doing with, of course. Um, more certainly um, the work, PPI work, I've been involved in over uh, the last 10 to 15 years, then very much more engagement with people and, and having that opportunity to understand their perspective on, on service provision in, in order to inform research and to shape some of that. But at the, again, moving towards the, the co-production end, what we're looking for is more than doing for, but is doing with, of course. And then you've got those words again, co-design and co-producing. And, and the same thing, so voices are heard and valued and then acted upon. So for me, and for us, um, where I work, it's been quite useful to think about the level of engagement that we've been able to achieve. And we probably sit, um, most of our work, I would say, is at the co-design end, um, although some of it is labeled co-production. But um, So I'm fortunate to work with, in, in a couple of projects, a guy called Glenn Robert, who, if you've uh, uh, heard of experience-based co-design, then Glenn was very much involved in the development of that particular work. And uh, Glenn's very good at sort of banging his fist on the counter here and saying uh, there, there are some important things that we just can't accept, if you like, that everybody's doing co-production. It's really important that we think carefully about what it is that we're claiming. So, I mean, it, it, you know, again, he would reiterate, I think, if uh, Glenn were here, that it's not new, but, but the way we're trying to engage with this in, in the health services and health research is different to some of the ways we've worked more recently. Um, it, it comes from radical origins, um, whether we're able to achieve that kind of radical shift in the way that patients work with us both in the health service and in research is, an, is a question, but, but a progression towards, I hope. Um, I know it particularly irritates Glenn about the, the, the terminology that's used and uh, that it's published elsewhere about some of those things. But uh, he, like others, is keen to see that co-production is, is not... Couple of points I wanted. To, oh, I am muted now. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
not, not just meeting together and listening to people, uh, but, but also important that we think about theories and or theories of change underpinning that activity. And that if we're doing this work, that it needs to be evaluated like all um, work rigorously um, and ideally theory based evaluation of those things. But um, some brief words then about um, how might we do that. Um, and back to what it is that we're trying to do. I think the work of Paul Batalden in the United States has been particularly informative in terms of thinking about how wholesale, um, you know, large, sorry, large scale um, service change might occur, occur in health services. So he's written extensively there and you can see his key words in there. It's about harnessing the knowledge of patients, carers and staff to make the changes that they care most about. <clears throat> And then the NIHR, again, through its involved organisation, you can see reiterating the kinds of things I've already talked about. Um, we, we've moved towards having national standards, which affect not just healthcare, but also the, the public sector. Um, but there's been fairly recent criticism of these, so very useful in terms of thinking about the issues, but some of these fundamental questions about when, why, and with whom to do this um, haven't necessarily been articulated as well as they might be. Um, so NIHR have tried to respond to some of that in the UK and there's some very useful guidance. They've gone from saying this is a really good thing and banging the drum and we ought to have a go at it in uh, 2015 and beginning to open up that debate much more. Following that with a what is co-production then, what does it look like, who does it, how is it to be done, through to now formally guidance on uh, research projects involving co-production. And then for most people, I think the better end of it. So what does it actually look like? So uh, examples of real cases where, where researchers and or service improvement have engaged with this process. So that's been very welcome. Um, Scotland's got a stall march on us, I think since 2010, they've got some absolutely brilliant examples right across the board in terms of how this might be done at various levels. And their 100 stories about co-production is an evolving project, but it's, it's just a fantastic sort of resource and database and they've got a co-production coming, co-production week coming up in November that you might want to participate in, certainly maybe follow it on Twitter if nothing else. Um, there's been calls for models of how to do uh, co-production on the back of some of that and uh, a useful uh, publication by someone called uh, Hawkins and colleagues um, a couple of years ago. If you're involved in complex intervention development, you'd recognize, I'm sorry that it's a bit blurry, but um, the, the, on the left-hand side, the, the early parts of intervention development through evidence review um, perhaps some qualitative research, consultation with clinicians and so on, and, and looking at what's happening now. And at the far end, you'd be familiar with perhaps uh, development of intervention materials and expert review of those before you prototype them and test them in feasibility studies. So nothing new there. Um, but in the middle has been inserted a, a co-production approach um, going beyond consultation. We've got new guidance from the Medical Research Council due at the end of this year or early next year, and it's almost certainly going to focus on this kind of engagement, so more formally embedding it in complex intervention development now. Before I talk about the two examples that we've been involved in most recently, one of them, one of our colleagues at the front here is involved in, but of course this is, not only is it not new, but it's not, you know, it, this is something that's happening worldwide. I'm very aware of, and I was interested to read of a couple of things that were happening here at HMRI, and you'll know them better than me if you watch the ABC presentation around stroke stories. These have been, you know, they're, they're examples of involvement in ways which are really beneficial, it seems to me, for both wider public understanding, but also better researcher and clinician understanding. And I know Coralie and colleagues uh, have been recently working on a co-designing an exercise program, um, which, which uh, has used a series of workshops to engage people in that process. And I know in terms of experience-based co-design, um, one of the things about EBCD is there's been about 60 different projects, um, but very little formal evaluation, certainly no randomized controlled trials until very recently. And in Victoria, the core study, which reports, I think, later this year or early next, is a very large scale EBCD within a trial. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see the sort of robust evaluation that will come from that. And I know um, Julie Bernhardt and colleagues at the Floria are also investigating uh, development of a redesign re of a rehabilitation spaces using a similar sort of process. So I just wanted to acknowledge that there clearly is lots of work going on everywhere. This is just my take on some of these things. So I'm going to talk briefly, hopefully, about um, two studies, create and recreate. They're not connected at all. No, no idea why the second one became recreate, but it did. Uh, create is, was asked, to, it's about, it's, well, it stands for collaborative rehabilitation environments in acute stroke. But our question was, can patients, carers and clinicians co-produce increases in social, cognitive and physical activity on acute stroke units? And why would you want to do that? Um, because there's been a 40 year uh, sort of research history of acknowledging that people generally are inactive and alone. 
lots of papers. I just picked out four here, one of which Heidi was involved in. But the yellow line at the bottom is perhaps the most important. These studies consistently demonstrated um, that people were inactive, very low levels of, of activity generally, and, and long periods of time when people were not only not stimulated and engaged, but they were alone. So why did we want to use co-production? Well, partly because it seemed to be an intractable problem, 40 <coughs> years worth of research and no really breaks in that. Um, so, but we did know that most of the studies were externally researcher driven, so the experts were shaping how it should be. Um, little or no patient involvement um, and no real significant change. So EBCD was an opportunity for us to look at, would that be a different way in? Would it allow us to work differently? Could we use it in stroke services? Um, and we, we liked the, the ethos underpinning it. It was a natural progression for us, I think. Um, just very briefly in terms of methods, it's, I just wanted to uh, give you a, a, an overview. So it's an, um, it was a mixed methods case study evaluation in four stroke units, two in London, two in Yorkshire. You can see there the range of activity we're engaged in from a quantitative behavioral mapping approach through to non-participant observation interviews and, and so on, and also an embedded process evaluation. So quite a comprehensive study running over three years. But, but the, the key I think was to have a look for us was to look at the structured approach that experience-based co-design offers. And I think the word structure is really important now, there are a range of things going on here, but just moving around this circle fairly quickly, then one of the things that's really important is to understand what's going on now. So to engage with staff and gather their experiences, and you can do that in lots of standard ways. We didn't do anything unusual there. But, but what EBC does do is use the experience explicitly. So on the bottom right, as you move around engaging patients and gathering experiences, the interviews with, with patients and their carers are videoed. The, so we did about... Um, quite a large number of interviews, but then we edited those down to about 19 or 20 minutes worth of uh, trigger points. So powerful experiences that the patients selected and agreed that this was their video to show to the staff in their units and to, to begin the process of dialogue. So that, that evidence collection, if you like, is then uh, moved through a process of the staff get together and talk about what the issues are and hear the feedback and findings about their work. Uh, the patients get together separately from the staff and talk about uh, their experiences, view the video, agree the edits, and get ready to talk to the staff. It's a preparatory and important part of that, that phase. Then they come together in a joint event, um, and the edited film is the first part of that joint event. So the trigger video, if you like, is, is used as the first part. After that, they, they uh, agree to smaller groups, get together as co-design groups, often five or six people. This is staff and patients and carers together, uh, and they form small co-design teams working over a period of months might meet four times, six times, eight times. They decide how many times they'll meet, but that's where the work is done. And then of course you evaluate thereafter. So it's a, it's a service improvement model predominantly. Um, what we found using those range of data sources is, is no surprise. There were quite high levels of inactivity in all those sites. The non-participant observations confirmed that. The patient dependency level was very high, poor facilities, few resources to support any activity should that change. The, the staff interviews were, if you like, not quite hopelessness, but there was a lot of uh, staff were very, um, very uncomfortable with, with what they could provide and really had a fervent hope that, that, that change could occur. Something must be done was a common, uh, we've got to do something about it, but, but they felt powerless to make change, I think, or even though they desired it. And the, the patient video, very hard to summarize, but, uh, but one thing, a big message that they fed back to staff is we want to do more, not just to be more active and you know, if you like, be involved in more cognitive or stimulating activities, but to do more but physically, cognitive, socially, to do more for ourselves, to do more with our, with our families. But, but nobody will tell us what we can do and what it's safe to do and when we can do it. So it was a really powerful message. The staff said, we spend all day talking to people and we give them lots of information, um, but, but they weren't giving them the kind of information that the patients themselves wanted. Um, so the... The, the film was really important, I think. Uh, it did several things, and this chap's given us permission to, he doesn't like the shot, but he's happy for us to show the film. But it, it makes the experience real, that's obvious, isn't it? Um, there were some powerful positive messages about how good staff were, but there were some very critical negative messages, and the two together were, was helpful. Sometimes those messages were difficult for the staff. There were tears when people listened to this, um, as well as smiles and nods and all those things. But what they talked about was things that could be worked on, realistic things that were everyday part of the, the stroke unit. And the, for me, that, and for all of us, I think, that the video really was the catalyst that began the dialogue. That was the opportunity to talk 
openly and realistically about what was actually happening in those units. Um, this was hard evidence, if you like. And, and without that, the, the, the partnership working, I'm sure, would have been much more difficult. Um, the co-design groups, I mean, it's a poor analogy perhaps, but they were very much the engine of uh, experience-based co-design. They really drove uh, the engagement activity and the, and the change that occurred. But the people that helped make that work, there's absolutely no doubt. We had two researchers who were, uh, if you like, almost embedded in those units, um, and that they really oiled the wheels. Their facilitation remotely and uh, also, also as part of those meetings was, was critical to the success in this particular project of experience-based co-design. They spent many, many, many hours both in the units, but also outside the units, hours on the phone, making sure things happened and chasing things up. So the staff worked extremely hard as members of those groups, but the facilitators put in a huge amount of time and effort to make it work. The other thing that I think really made the changes in these environments uh, was about uh, thinking what about the resources and assets that existed in the hospital um, because the staff in the units typically said they want letters. Um, it was a common, very common thing. They won't let us do this, they won't let us do that. They, we've tried to change this, but they, they stopped us doing that. So the, some of the first questions early on were who is they then? So who are these blocks? Um, it's obvious stuff, isn't it really? I mean, but, but basically very, quite quickly people identified that there was, you know, you could find they, and you could invite they in, and you could ask they in the meeting, why can't we do this? Um, and often their answer was, well, either it's problematic, but we probably can, or, well, we can do. Why, why on earth, what are you worried about? So getting some of these people that are listed here involved was, was critical, made a huge difference um, from um, just managers up to the chief exec in, in some places. Um, when the managers didn't work, <coughs> getting the chief exec involved made the managers work. Again, it's not rocket science, but, but it's, it was hard work from the facilitators uh, to get the staff to shift their thinking from we can't, they want letters to we can because it's happening on Ward 39 or in this unit or that unit. In fact, it's already happening elsewhere in this place. So why can't we do it? Uh, the other thing was inviting the community in. That made a big difference because if there's anything that sustained these projects after we and the project left, it's the community uh, volunteers uh, and the carers of stroke survivors. So they did things that uh, were not, you know, they're not too dramatic, but um, there, there were three areas across the four units that everybody really wanted to focus on. So the environment and the space, communication and culture, um, and activity coordination. The, the photographs hopefully show that these were dark and dingy, not very welcoming places. Um, they're normal, they're, well, maybe they're a lot better in Australia, but they, if you went around most units in the UK, this is the sort of entrance you would find, and, and it's not welcoming, it's not stimulating. So some of the things that the co-design groups did, again, driven, I think, largely by patient experience, was to say, does it have to be like that? Uh, you know, and the staff would say, well, we've nowhere to put all this equipment. Well, something changed and they did get rid of that equipment. And somebody went to Ikea and bought that table and chairs and the community came in and painted those windows. And, that, and you might say, well, that's fine, of course, that that's just a change in the environment. But I mean, what we don't have is lots of pictures of people now in those spaces and they are that's 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 what's changed they're in those spaces and they're active with each other uh, with their families and with staff um, so a, a very similar thing here another unit up north it was even worse um, so a clinical staff meeting place it was called the day room but the patients and their families never entered that space um, it's it, it's changed to be a very different space these are the this is the same space below uh, and again was driven by that uh, uh, the, the groups working together, if you like, to change that and asking why can't that space be made accessible? Why can't we use that? And why can't we do things in there collectively? And again, you know, that space is now used a lot. And one of the most comical things for us, I think, was every single unit we went to, they said, well, we've got iPads. We can give them lots of activities on the iPads. But then you would say, so where are the iPads? And they'd say, oh, we have to keep them locked up. We can't let anybody use them. We can use them in therapy, um, but then we have to lock them away again. <laughs> and of course, the patients said, well, that's excuse it, that's bloody ridiculous. Why, why on earth would you keep them locked up? Well, of course, they'll get stolen and all of that. But the solution, because that's a real problem, people were very worried and the manager said they must be under lock and key, was somebody went out and bought these stands. Um, they, they weren't cheap, but these stands are very simple, you know, like an IV stand, but it does mean they're flexible, they're safe, um, and they're now in use continuously. Um, so then bringing the community in was really important. And again, this lady, Carolina, was very good. She not only um, rang these people and they donated paint for free, but she collected it. And then on a Saturday, she was involved with other people from that community painting the murals uh, and also in facilitating other activities. So EBCD provided that opportunity, experience-based co-design, for people's voices to be heard, 
for them to be their ideas to be debated and for there to be opportunity for action to be taken um, to make change in those environments it, so it was very there, there are lots of qualitative findings but <laughs> this one uh, makes me laugh a little bit i think it's, think it's worthwhile and it, and it speaks to does this make a difference in terms of how people think and what happens in terms of their practice from a patient point of view and also from a staff point of view so this guy wouldn't engage in therapy she got him involved in washing the plants in the window you might just be able to see them uh, and then he did a bit better in therapy on the engagement sessions thereafter but one of the physios said this is a bit like i wasn't up for this woolly hippie stuff and that's our project um, that you lot are up to but i could see how it worked so changing people's thinking about that was another thing that happened in create not initially with some resistance but later it did make a difference I haven't really got time to let you look at all of those but one of the things I did want to say too is that of course it, staff had to work hard there was no extra time um, they were challenged by their managers because they weren't delivering 45 minutes or an hour of therapy sessions they were spending an hour in this woolly hippie stuff group um, looking to change things uh, so a bit short-sighted that it couldn't change things in the longer term <clears throat> but here you've got people saying yeah it was a massive workload but at the end, she says, so I was happy to help bring those changes. It was worth that investment. Uh, and then someone else talking down there about the power of that opportunity to sit together. So um, did it make a huge difference? Well, I, I know you're going to say <laughs> from the behavioural mapping. No, it didn't. Uh, it, or at least it didn't have a significant difference across all the four sites. Uh, we didn't measure the same patients before and after. We, we measured um, at the beginning and then we measured nine months later. Um, there was some improvement in activity in some units. If you look at physical, social and cognitive elements assessed by behavioural mapping. Um, but there were improved environments and facilities. There was more going on if you looked at it qualitatively. Certainly the staff were much more positive about changes, but not everyone liked the EBCD process or could be involved in it. Um, the, the patients certainly felt they benefited. For them, it added value. It was both giving something back, um, but it was also um, making changes and making them visible. Um, so did it add value? Yes, I think so. Um, we were able to deliver this in, in everyday health services, uh, both in a long form and short form. It did make a difference in terms of the quality of the experience that people had. Um, the, its success for me was on this, it was about structured staff-led groups, but also the social groups that came in from uh, community volunteers. And, and that's the stuff that's being sustained, structured staff-led groups and community volunteer work. Um, it recreates a very different project. Um, it's, it's very much about reducing um, sedentary behaviour after stroke and it's focused on uh, increasing standing and moving. Um, it was underpinned by a behaviour change wheel, so not EBCD. Um, so we ran two co-production groups concurrently, one in Edinburgh and one in Leeds. Um, so quite long distances, about three and a half hours by train. I know that's not long, a long distance in Australian terms, but um, one of the things that was really important for us was to have a researcher the same researchers, the one from Edinburgh and the one from Leeds, were in, in all of the co-production meetings in Leeds, and they were both also in the Edinburgh meetings. We were very keen that they should share that experience. And it was underpinned, as I say, by the behaviour change wheel. And if we had more time, I'd, I'd go through that, but, but we'd, we haven't. But this is responding partly to Glenn Roberts' concern. It was important that we had, um, if you like, a theory of change, and we used a particular approach to, to uh, developing that change within a complex intervention approach. Um, this is just a flavour of the whole study, just to Obviously, it sits within that uh, complex intervention development. The first part looks at evidence review. We looked at what was going on now. So the, the model we looked at earlier on, the Hawking model, in the middle of that is that intervention development stuff. And then obviously, we, we, well, we're at now this mixed methods feasibility stage before a large trial. So co-production, very important in developing the intervention to be tested. Nothing new here, very similar perhaps to your approach in terms of uh, exercise program design five different workshops running across um, a period of from September last year until March of this year. Um, I think the key thing again, um, a particular focus for each of those meetings, um, same group in all five meetings, um, but underpinned by the behaviour change wheel. And the way it was underpinned, um, basically the model uh, describes eight different stages to progress through from understanding the problem through to actually being identified ways in which you can deliver a particular intervention. And what, what the research team did was to interweave. Um, so the work started before um, the co-production groups, um, both in terms of evidence generation, but then in terms of interpreting that evidence, how could you feed that evidence into uh, co-production groups where you had a very mixed audience of clinicians and patients and carers? How could you um, ensure that people understood that information, but in a way that they could utilize? 
So again, I think the analogy for me that's best here is really ducks, you know, serenely on the pond, underneath, but you know, it all looks fine, they're floating along, but underneath, then they're paddling furiously very often, aren't they, to achieve that. I think our researchers said it felt like that the whole time. That they were really struggling to keep up with um, a co-production meeting, which was great, was exciting. There's lots of uh, energy, lots of information developed. People were very happy to think about the target behavior and how we could change the behavior of staff and patients and carriers. But translating that and then find, you know, putting it into a form that could be used in the next co-production meeting so we could move on and start thinking about what those behaviors would entail, what it would look like in clinical practice, what examples we could develop. That was really hard work for the researchers. Um, they used a variety of tools to do that. And one of which was quite powerful was personas or case studies were case studies drawn from the evidence. So fictitious, but drawn from the evidence and then used in those co-production meetings. And then very structured ways of capturing both the case and also the uh, different ways in which solutions, if you like, um, in this, uh, our word for interventions could be developed. So I'm sorry, I'm rushing now, aren't I? But my apologies. Um, so the co-production workshops were, were just as you might expect. There were a range of uh, discussion forums with uh, patients and carers and staff. Uh, and again, just the, the clinical staff, you know, they were, they were giving up two hours um, every other month, you know, to, to, to engage with us. So there was significant managerial support. There was uh, extremely high levels of engagement by those members of staff. So we're talking about six to eight, you know, key clinicians from a stroke service in both settings, giving up that amount of time and, and their managers being supportive and giving up that time. And we paid them no more than, um, you know, two hours salary back into the service. So um, minimal investment on our part and huge investment from theirs. Um, so they did the five co-production works, but the staff also stayed involved in producing videos, which are part of the intervention development. They reviewed prototype materials, again, all of which was, you know, was done as part of their routine clinical roles. So a huge investment of their time in that level of support. Um, so this was a bit of a different study to EBCD. Uh, combining the um, behavior change wheel was, was really important, I think, in terms of intervention development and getting targeted and focused on, on what we could actually achieve. Um, it, it certainly engaged um, stakeholder voices in that process as, as before, but, but the structure and the in, interrelationship um, between the co-production opportunity to talk through these issues, then to clear evidence, and then to target intervention development thereafter was, was a key, I think, to the success for this particular approach. People loved it um, in terms of staff and in terms of patients. Very hard to find any feedback which was negative. Some people felt it was a bit rushed on occasion. Um, some people felt it was a bit difficult to get hold their head around some of the material on occasion, but, but predominantly people thought all of these words were important. These are taken from their feedback sheets. Um, it's not so straightforward, I think, in combining those things from an intervention development point of view. It was, it was very, very helpful. It really got us to the point we needed to be in terms of having an intervention ready to be tested in the feasibility study. So big tick from a researcher point of view. Um, but quite how far you know, we, we were able to step back and for there to be equal power for people's voices were heard, but, but how far they were truly shaped that intervention, how far we were able to stay um, closely to the things that mattered most to that group that we work with was really quite a challenge. And I think it, it, the great credit goes to the two researchers who uh, not only traveled up and down the country to attend those meetings, but spent two days after each of those meetings deciphering the data, making sure that those key points, the words that were mattered to the staff and to the patients were prominent in the next stage of the behavior um, change development, the intervention development was, was, was uh, very strongly adhered to from the sort of patient point of view, even when it, it, it challenged our ideas, even when it made it look as though it might be much harder to deliver the kind of intervention we thought should be delivered. Um, that they worked really hard to keep those voices really prominent and upfront. But um, I, I don't think we can claim it was certainly as um, equal power in that, in that regard. I mean, we engage with people as far as possible. We, we took on board all of their views. Um, we fed back to them routinely. They endorsed, if you like, the intervention which has been developed thereafter and, and stay involved in it uh, now, as it were. But um, how far we were down that continuum is still debatable, I think. So for me, does it add value? Yes, um, at all these levels. Um, but it adds value if the bottom sort of sections are, are considered. One thing we, we don't do well, I think, we through Involve in the UK, we, we, we train very often participants now in this kind of group. We, we pay them, uh, we make sure they have adequate expenses, and we, we invest time and energy in training them to do that work. And that's absolutely as it should be. But we don't do the same with staff, um, or at least we don't routinely do that. In the EBCD project, we did. We took them to London Point of Care Foundation training, and we did do that. But it, it's not that common to 
um, see projects or published work where the staff training is highlighted um, because this is a, a very different way to work and we don't always do that staff training. The time and resource commitment, I, I, well, I'm also amazed that people will do it because of the amount of time they have to give up clinically or give up personally, but, but people do. Um, but I think if we're really going to move it down that continuum, then that, this is about a, a shift in thinking, a cultural shift. And the best examples for me are in some of the Scandinavian hospitals, particularly in Sweden and Norway, where they've moved towards patient-centered hospitals. Of course, all hospitals should be patient-centered, shouldn't they? But you know, I can see the people grinning, and of course, they're not always, are they? And, and we understand why that is. But, but really, truly, there are some examples in, in those two countries, Norway and Sweden, where, where that looks to be the focus, where there is a significant shift in the way in which people think and work. And EBCD and that kind of approach is embedded in not only in their philosophy, but in their direct care delivery activity. We know a lot and we should be sharing more of it. Um, so that's important too. But I'll probably overrun a little bit, but somewhere near. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> More than happy to respond to questions or comments. Thanks, David. That was amazing. Um, very comprehensive overview of the history of co-design and co-production, and then some really uh, relevant clinical examples for us to learn from. So we might take some questions for those who are with us virtually. We'll take questions from HMRI first. Is anyone in this room have any questions for David? Yeah. Um, thanks, Dave. Great, great talk. Thank you. Um, and this is something that you and I have talked about a lot yeah. before. And it's where it, it's chap, it's whether we always need to be focused on the, the transformational change end mm -hmm. and the absolute power sharing. And I can see places where that's absolutely necessary. But I also struggle with when that's appropriate and when it's not, in mm. terms of if you are testing intervention that you know or that's put from a science perspective has some core elements that need to be in there. If you give all the power over to coming up with any idea to, to solve the problem, then maybe you're left with something that might not be effective. And yeah. when you decide yeah. how much you do the full co-production versus um, adapting something that's got some core components that you yeah. want to change. And I think it's an important question um, and we should debate it, I think. But for me, um, a, a quite a, a quick answer, I suppose, is it, it all depends on the, the point of the question, doesn't it? That we. So for me, if it's intervention development, then I think we need to go beyond consultation because um, I think that can be token. I think we need to genuinely engage with people and give them uh, an opportunity to for their voices to be, to be heard, their ideas to be heard, but in the context of, of what we already know. Um, in the recreate project people were very happy to were wanted to know about what we already knew and wanted to work with that and think about how they could use that or otherwise in their work so I think if it's intervention development we're after then we don't need the um, transformational co-production not necessary um, I think you need to be open and honest with people up front what's the project and, and that that's I think if you're looking at service improvement then I think there's much more opportunity to engage in a long-term change process which might be much more transformational. I know certainly some of the work that Glenn Robert did early on in terms of cancer services and even in ICU services has been transformational, I think. Um, but as the researchers left, the, the people stayed. So I think you know, that, that's where some of that power sharing and delivery and so on. So long answer, not short one. But I think it depends what you're after. Mm. Sorry, Coralie, your microphone didn't go through onto the Zoom. I, I think with the, um, with the explanation though, your question was understood by everyone. Um, so there's a question that's come through on Zoom and I'm going to quickly um, zoom up and find out what it was. So somebody at Hampstead is asking if the patient participants in the EBCD received training on how to participate. You sort of answered that somewhat already. But. Yeah, um, no, they didn't in the sense that did we take them you know, away for, um, for three hours and spend time educating them about uh, co-production or experience-based co-design, then, then no, that wasn't the case. But, um, but basically in the separate, um, well, I should take a step back. Um, they were involved, um, almost all of the participants came from um, interviews that, that we'd done as part of the information gathering phase. So they engaged with the researchers before that. But basically uh, the main training, if you like, in inverted commas, took place in the, the um, separate patient event. 
where where we came together and talked about the the project the process um, their involvement within it and how they could communicate with staff groups um, you know people that they'd uh, the experts who cared for them who would organize their their therapy if you like in most cases um, so it was through that separate um, staff sorry patient meeting process a three-hour meeting that we, we did that if you like training in the approach and then the facilitator um, spent a great deal of time so the researcher with uh, with these participants in terms of their preparation for um, involvement in the co-design meetings and talking to them after the co-design meetings had, had finished and making sure they were coming to the next co-design meetings um, so there was a, an informal support process running alongside this is what it's about and what we'd like it to do that support process i think was equally important so i hope that answers the question would you mind walking down, which is great for increasing physical activity. <laughs> Reducing and asking a question. <laughs> um, you could stand side by side actually and share the power in this interaction <laughs> and both use the same microphone. Sure. Being a speaker, Hang on, you, you need to come. I should be able to project my voice anyhow. Yes, yeah. but this Just is the only microphone. There it is. Happy yeah. day. Hi, I'm please. Linda Worrell. Hello. Hello, Linda. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to tease out the difference between EBCD. Yep and behaviour change wheel co-production approach mm -hmm. and whether you're saying that you're recommending one over the other. It seems like the behaviour change wheel is an added component to the EBCD and it's a, it's a more theoretical approach. Is that your sort of take on it? Yeah, if I gave the impression that I favoured one over no. the other, then that, that, that wasn't my intention. Mm. So uh, EBCD, its its origins, I think, are very much in quality improvement and service improvement. Yeah. And, and it's the, the E bit is the really important bit. It, it's um, people's experiences that drive that service improvement. Mm. Um, equally, in terms of the broader co-production enterprise, then I think experience um, of, of a service is important. But I think why we were, the, the behaviour change wheel was important. I don't mm. think it's necessary in service improvement. Um, I think it was necessary in terms of intervention development because mm. it provided us a, a very structured approach to behavior change. Mm. And, and for us, we weren't looking to improve the experience of stroke survivors in, in relation to their sedentary behavior in a hospital setting. What we were looking to do is to reduce that behavior sure. um, so, and, and increase standing and moving. So uh, in, in, in a sense, it was a, a different tool for yeah. a different purpose. Sure. And, so different uh, research questions yeah. as well. But I think also looking to document the process in terms of complex intervention development, it's really important that, that we're able to explain that away. And I think the co-production bit helped us focus. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to look at the stages of the intervention development so that they can be repl replicated, so that they can be, you know, all the usual things that are important, so that they can be amended or changed if they need to be. We can look at where they came from, how we got to that point, and how we might change that. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think that they're, they're different um, yeah. in their approach, but they still fit under that broad co-production umbrella. Mm. Yeah. True. Thank yeah. you. No, mm. thank you. I'll just check questions in from Zoom. Uh, if there's no one else that's got a question, I'll throw it in. Um, just quickly, um, oh, hang on. There is someone. Kirsty is asking, uh, yes, slide. I can share the slides with you later. That won't be a problem. Yep. Um, but my question is, um, what do you think needs to happen in order, you said we're not quite there yet with power sharing. Are there some key strategies that you have in mind of how we get there? I think um, one of the things that troubles me as a researcher is that you, you hear about an idea, you, you read two or three papers, and then bef before long, then it seems that that's the idea that we should employ in our next project. And I, I think it's very difficult in, in those busy academic and or clinical lives to step back and engage in that process. And interestingly, we, we've sent four of our researchers to NIHR training in co-production, thinking that would be a valuable investment. But what, we, what they found really was that the, the people who were delivering that training uh, we had talked about values and beliefs and ideals, but, but really could offer very little in terms of how do you do this in practice. Um, so I think one of the, the challenges is perhaps that we need to uh, share, you know, more examples of, of how to do this, if you like. One of the most useful workshops they've been to most recently is where about 100 researchers came together and said, uh, we've all been involved in projects which are co-production labelled. Uh, we've all been using behaviour change wheel to some extent and what there were just a series of workshops if it, uh, training people if you like uh, in that process uh, sort of learning bikes from experience and by experience 
So I think we need to properly engage with the process. Uh, you can read about it all day long. Um, you can go on courses where you're told what the right thing is to do. Um, but I think, you know, as a research community, we need to talk about some of the warts and all problems that exist. We need to share that kind of information. We need to look at, you know, which bits work and which don't. Um, and we need to address it, it, colleagues' question, I think, early on, some of the people didn't, if, you know, do we need to share power the whole time? Um, I think we do need an equal process in the group activities, and most of us are skilled at achieving that to ensure that people can, their voices are heard, and there is a genuine opportunity for them to influence the debate. Um, but, but this is not, you know, sort of emancipatory um, work. It's not civil rights type work that we're engaged in. You know, I think some of those principles should underpin everything we do, but I think the way in which we work um, you know, we can do a lot better with co-production if, we, if we're a lot clearer about what, a, what it means and B, how you do it. Uh, and then you can answer C, the question, should we do it in this project? Perhaps. Has anyone at the floor got any questions? Or for anyone on Zoom, last chance. Uh, yep, so there's a comment um, from Ken. About sharing a practical example, I'm um, just in the interest of time. Is there a specific question that you have about that, Ken, that we could answer? Unless you'd like to. So Ken's sharing a practical example of the formation of the Hunter New England Male Health Network. Um, so now they have involved over 300 representatives from a range of community and government organisations, which is fantastic. And there's no questions from the floor. <laughs> I'll be at smart strokes. I mean, if there, there may be people from the floor there, it'd be good to, to meet up. And I'm sorry, Ken, perhaps not the, enough time to, to hear about the work, but um, uh, my email is on the bottom of the, the last slide. I'd be very interested to know where I could find a bit more out about that. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a final thank you, um, David, for coming today. I forgot to say at the beginning, David is out here in Australia for the Smart Stroke Conference, which is up at the Hunter Valley at Crown Plaza on Thursday and Friday. So if anybody here or anybody in Zoom land is attending that conference, you could catch up with David there as well. But um, I'm sure he'd be happy to take an email as sure, well. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks again. We're going to uh, yeah, move next you. door and have something to eat. Maybe we can chat more then. But thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.